So I was just saying that I was going to talk about the three things I wish I would have told myself eight years ago before I started online business, business automation and work-life balance. And my goal for you today is that you understand the basic principles of business automation so that your work-life balance can improve. Now, who am I to stand here and talk to you? If you really look at me, in essence, I'm just some kid talking about work-life balance, and that doesn't work, right? So, the reason I think I got invited here is because of what happened to me in the last eight years. And I think that by sharing those stories, something might pop up that you can resonate with. That's why I said to you two that you have more experience in business than uh, the others, for now but uh, you can compare to the systems and see whether you can optimize. For the ones that haven't had the experience yet, you can shortcut hopefully a lot, and that's why I also have the Q&A at the end, so that if you have some practical questions, I can go deeper into your situation. So, it's a really nice goal to give, right? To understand the basic principles of business automation. In the last eight years, what happened to me is when I first started out, I had big issues because I didn't have a family supporting me. Not only did that pop up, I also didn't have money, so I was forced to work eight to nine part-time jobs as a student because I believed in the idea of getting a degree. Since I was six years old, somehow I had this idea of graduating in law. And this vision had kept me going through this rough period of, of no support, no money, um, and at one point health declining. So as I was going through this health declining phase where um, I felt stress taking over, um, I was picking up books, law books, and you have to be interested in law to read them because else you're just staring there. Um, but it, it's even worse when you have all these jobs. So because I had so many jobs, my focus was constantly diverted. And I was picking up these books, and I was focusing on them, but I was thinking at eight or nine things at the same time. Does anyone have that experience before? Nobody? Yeah. 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 yeah, cool. So I'm not the only one. And as I was focusing on these books, I realized if I continue going like this, I will never pass and get that idea that I always wanted, which is a diploma, right? Not only that, I was pretty sure that if I was gonna continue, I might end up somewhere in an institution because the way I was burning out at a consistent tempo was not normal. I had minor burnouts where you just sit there for a week, you can't do anything because your mind just doesn't respond. And then you kind of pick yourself up and you go again. And so every time I pick myself up and I, go and I do more, and then I burn out even more, and so on and so on. And the first thing that I wish I would have told myself was, I wish I would have balanced my life before I put myself into high stress positions. Now what do I mean with that? Whenever you start building a business, or studying really hard, or you have a new partner and you, you're building that relationship, in some way it is a high stress situation, especially um, if ups and downs occur, especially in an entrepreneurship lifestyle, it's ups and downs constantly. So when I was going through that period of eight to nine jobs and no family support and, and just exam period coming in, I discovered a pamphlet. And this pamphlet is written by Kenton Knapper. It's super underground. Uh, it's like 20 pages long, it's super small. And he literally says, you'll read this once and you'll remember it forever, because the principles are so simple. And in essence, what he says in that pamphlet is, health, wealth, and relationships are the three main areas. And every problem, any problem that you might have is divided into those three areas. And, and so I tested it out. I tested it out on myself and I, and I started asking people, what kind of problem do you have? And then I started looking is it possible to divide it into those three areas? And each area has an internal and an external component. <clears throat> so now for the first time, I, I was in this position, but I was mapping out my life. I was looking, okay, I'm struggling, but with what am I struggling? So I looked at my health, I looked at my wealth, I looked at my relationships. 
And I realized the biggest struggle at that point is I didn't have support. And support of a partner, support of good friends or mentors that carry you through hardships in business is very important. So I realized I need to focus one by one and improve the basics. And improving the basics is most important. So I started focusing on finding the right mentors. I started focusing on finding the right partner, someone I envisioned that could be good for me and support me and would understand the struggles that I would go through. And it became really systematic. So at one point, um, I hit a level where I consumed all the free content. YouTube, Google, going to free speeches. And I realized that I hit a wall. Just like you go to the gym, you hit a wall. And what do you do when you hit a wall? Does anybody know? If you go to the gym and you hit a wall, what do you do? Change your training. Change your training. What if you've done all the trainings and none of them work anymore? What do you do? Anybody? And it starts. You get demotivated and stuff. Yes, but there is a hack. And the hack is you get a personal trainer that is on a higher level. Imagine you're, you're going for Arnold Schwarzenegger style. As you grow, at one, at one point, it's a, professional, it's a profession for you, right? So at one point, you're going to get a professional trainer. He's going to get you to the next level. The same goes in mental health. The same goes in relationships and so on. So I traveled at that point to New York because I found a mentor there that I resonated with. Because I can stand here and tell you my story, but if you don't resonate with me, you're not going to learn anything. Because there, there are, I can tell you all the studies in the world, but you know this logically. If you don't resonate with me, you're not going to listen to half of the things that I say. So I traveled to New York, to this person specifically. He taught me the dynamics of groups and how I should interact. And he, he taught me stuff that I couldn't even imagine when I went there. So when I went there, I was thinking, oh my God, this is my last money, what am I gonna do? Like I literally took everything out of my bank account to put the deposit down, and, and, and then I started working even more, and I, got, I thankfully got the money, and I went to New York, and I came back with a completely different mindset, a completely different system. And so I learned the first thing, which was, um, I focused on something, I learned the basics, I invested in myself, and I got a return on investment. Those kind of investments, investing into health, investing into relationships, you don't see them, they're not tangible. But my mentor once told me, for every dollar you invest in yourself, you're gonna get $10 back. And I've tried it, and it worked for me. The only issue is that people think, okay, I'm gonna invest $1,500, $2,000, and it becomes like, ridiculous. I saw some people investing $20,000 but they don't execute. So what's the point of investing if you don't execute? So it's very important to consume all the free content and see if you're executing on the free content before you start um, going. Just like with the personal trainer, you're gonna pay for the personal trainer once you've consumed all the free content and you've hit a level where you can't grow unless you ask someone better. Which brings us to the second thing I wish I would've told myself. As I was going through the relationships and I was growing my relationships and getting better and more confident there, I realized I needed to go to the next thing, the next thing, the basics that I could cover there. And automatically I ended up somehow discovering a community that called themselves biohackers. And they were very into health. They looked at their body as a system and everything was tracked. Most of you know Tim Ferriss probably. So Tim Ferriss is the extreme of that biohacker community. He did blood tests, I think, every day and stuff like that. I did blood tests every month. Why? Because the research had already been done by Tim Ferriss and Dave Asprey and all those people. I just needed to check that it works for my body. And so I got into this biohacker community and I met some people. And what I, what I understood is that they all see the world as a system. It's all a system to them. And it's all about optimizing that system one by one. They don't do everything together. It's all a system and one by one, they improve every point. So this mindset of having a system and improving it, how do they do that practically? They use trackers for everything. So they would do blood analysis every day, every month, whatever, and they put it next to each other and they have a chart. And so you see in your chart what works. 
So for instance, I would eat really bad eggs, like the cheapest eggs you can get, because I heard somewhere, if you want to go bulk up, you need eggs. And I ate like four or five eggs, and I went to the doctor and they thought I was going to have a heart attack, because I was eating the bad eggs. <laughs> And so what happened afterwards, I discovered um, a farmer close to me and I knew the chickens there were good. So I got those eggs and I was eating four or five of those eggs and I did my blood analysis. And what did my blood analysis show after that? That my cholesterol, the good one, which is normal, is always bad. The good one suddenly was twice as high as average, which is very good because your cholesterol is your, um, it feeds your immune sy system. And your bad, my bad cholesterol was half of the, the average. And before that, it was like twice the average. Um, I didn't only change the eggs. I changed more foods that had toxins in them. But the tracker of having the blood analysis and all that stuff helped me in deciding what worked and what didn't work. So that brings me to the third thing, which is the business automation. And the third thing I wish I would have told myself is don't work in your business, work on your business. So today they asked me to talk about business automation. But I'm standing here to, to spread a message of work-life balance. And not the message that people say, go forget work and get your life in order, go meditate and stuff like that. Because we have this trend now that goes into the other extreme of go meditate, go do that. And it's not how it should be. You should find an optimal point of where you enjoy yourself, where you're happy, where you balance all those three areas. So the third thing, I went into wealth. And I started using the systems that I learned from the biohackers into my business. And suddenly, I wasn't just doing sales. I looked and mapped out my business step by step. And I used trackers for every aspect. And based on those trackers, I could optimize. And what popped up sometimes is that I was working 10 hours, 12 hours on something that I could easily outsource to someone else. And just by doing that simple exercise, I get, at this point, I get some clients that you'd be surprised that still do these mistakes. Most of the big clients that are in business 50, 100 years, they still work with really rudimentary systems. And so when I present them the business automation systems on how you can apply uh, software, uh, how you can apply hardware, how you can apply people in such a way that your entire business is automated so that you can focus on what actually matters, um, they, don't, they don't have the time to do that. And that's why some entrepreneurs are getting really fast, really rich. One of my mentors is literally doing just that. What he does is he creates a system, creates a business, maps out the entire pro process step by step. He goes to another company and he sells that. And he's done that three times now. So what I want to uh, tell you is that you look at some of those big companies the way I also look at, I used to look at them and think, oh my God, these are giants. They're not going to listen to me. But they, they're working on very rudimentary systems still. So you have all the benefit because we, we're in the 21st century, you understand online better than most of these big companies because they have their traditions. So you can go to them and tell them, look, this is the system. This is how you can use this software because sometimes, sometimes they don't even know a simple app like Boomerang on Gmail. The Boomerang is an app that you can install in your Gmail and then when you get an email, do you have that moment where you get an email and you're like, I can't be bothered with that right now, but tomorrow maybe I can? So Boomerang gets you a, a, a thing, you click on it, and then you say, postpone this message in two days or three days, and then it just sends it back. So simple apps like Evernote, simple apps, like all these things. There's a, there's a new app for Instagram that can schedule your posts. Most of the big companies still don't know this exists. What I'm trying to say is these are examples, but the system's mindset and the way you apply it, the step-by-step -step procedure can be very simple. The, the biggest mentors that I have have a notebook just I ha like I have there and their entire business is written down there. My entire business is written down in that notebook. The step-by-step -step procedures. Um, I don't recommend this. I only recommend this for the next thing that I'm going to tell you, which is genie trips. So when you go work on your business, right? The issue is you're very much in your business. How do you plug out? 
The way you plug out is by completely going away. So one of my mentors, what he does is he goes for two weeks to Thailand. Why Thailand? It's cheap and all the help is there and they clean and they cook and everything. First week he completely plugs out, completely. No electronics, no nothing, reads a couple of books, that's it. Second week he takes his notebook, starts mapping out his business and one by one he starts looking, what can I outsource, what can I delegate, how can I make this bigger and so on and so on. So for a genie trip a notebook is perfect. But if you really go and think about selling your business, maybe it's time to go and do it on the online space. So another client of mine, what he does is he has a Wikipedia style page on his website, so it's closed off, and then the step-by-step -step of every procedure that's going on in this company is written down. And, and so when I have, for instance, when I have to work for him, he sends me one of his pages of the step-by-step -step procedure that needs to happen, and just go over the list. So that's business automation on the basic principle. So if you apply that basic principle, the way I discovered this, so that's the personal story, the way I discovered this, I was, uh, so I was doing the biohacking community, I was doing the relationships, and I was figuring out that the biohacker community had given me what I wanted to know, and I wanted to continue. I wanted to, to grow into business. I was still doing these eight or nine jobs and law school. And it was horrible. Like, it was horrible on my body. Um, the, the health that I learned in biohacking gave me a better body to cope with it, but it was still a lot. So I needed a system where I could earn as much money as I did with those eight or nine jobs. So the first thing that popped up with, uh, to me is I need, it wasn't a business, it was I need a system. And so a brand came out of it. I needed to work for myself. And so my first brand came out of that. And I applied all the systems on that brand. And what popped up uh, is a, a video from an Australian guy. I was, you know, you scroll through YouTube, you scroll through Google, and out of nowhere, this Australian guy pops up and he says, uh, it's like this group of guys that's traveling around the world and they're, they're on the beaches with their laptops. And the Australian guy says, do you want freedom, fun, and adventure? Do you want to sit next to the beach with your laptop? Sign up now. I was like, what? And, and just, I looked at it and I couldn't believe it was possible. I couldn't believe you could just open your laptop, everything automated, and then you just close it the way Tim Ferriss described in this four hour work week book. Uh, which at this point is unfortunately a little bit outdated. But I started reading a blog post, and one of the blog posts, um, I don't remember what it was about, but the main key that I remember was business automation. It was possible to delegate and it was possible to outsource. And somehow in my mind, it didn't pop up that it would be possible. So taking it back to my eight or nine jobs, the way I did it, I started just listing all of the eight or nine jobs. And I started looking, so one of the jobs was tutoring law students. And I started looking, how can I outsource this, which was taking most of my time. And it was actually very simple. I was performing in the top three in the company. So I went to my boss, I asked for a raise, I got the raise. The margin of that raise I used to employ other students, and that way, that was completely outsourced. So now I could focus on my studies. So this is my first introduction to automation on such a level. So I wasn't tutoring, I was doing only quality management. I learned Can to I do... Can I ask a question? Yes. So um, in what way is that beneficial to your boss? So because I was still doing the quality management. So the students were passing. All of the students that I always tutored, the reason I got the raise, is because all of those students still passed. So you hired somebody in who yeah. you thought could do as good a job as you yeah. could? Yeah. Yeah. So it was partially the trust that I had in the people that I was helping, which was something I needed to learn uh, very soon as well. But I don't recommend doing this, obviously. But it was the first introduction that I had in automation. Check with your boss, probably they're not going to be happy with that. But it, it got me to the next point where I started founding my business and I started applying those principles, recruiting the right people, uh, trusting the people that they would deliver and doing the quality checks. And those were the three things that I wish I would have told myself, where the first one was, I wish I would have balanced my life before I put myself into high-stress situations, 
because when you found a business or when you're interested in something entrepreneurial, you're going to go through horrible things sometimes because of the failures. And you need a mentor that guides you through it. You need a partner that supports you so that you don't feel lonely. And in five or ten years, what, and this is literally what, what's happening with some of my clients that are 30, 40 years. They're doing their business for a long time and they've done really well, way better than I've done, but they just disband their whole uh, business because they're not happy anymore, it's just not clicking, something's not right. Um, and just balance it before, have the right people before, have a mentor that has been there so that he warns you not to enter certain areas because of what can happen in 20 years where you just jump and everything breaks down. And then the second thing is use trackers and think about the systems mindset, not only in business. We do it with our money. Our bank does it. So why don't we do it in our life? Use trackers for your life. Anything that you want to improve, use trackers for it. You want to improve your health? Use a tracker. You want to improve your relationship? What I do with my relationship, every Sunday, we have a thing called relationship review. So we grade <laughs> each other on how we're doing. It's that simple, right? But what you know basis? what happens? Sorry? What basis? When is it good? So she never grades 10. <laughs> but what happens is when we've had weeks where it's a five or a six and it consists and it's like one week, two weeks and three weeks, we know something is happening. It's, it's one thing when you kind of feel it, but then it's too late. But when you're tracking, you really can not track it. And then it's like, oh, we need to change something up because it's the third week now. So these simple things, and th these are the simple things, um, but use trackers and think about the systems mindset. And then the third thing is, what if you're going into this entrepreneurial journey, apply the biohackers mindset, the systems mindset into your business. Because most of the companies you, you talk to, you might talk to a lot of startups. When I usually talk to startups that have failed, I ask them, where have you failed? And they can't tell me. They, they literally can't tell me because they don't have a system. Um, if you, imagine you, you would have a mentor. And you have an entire system of your business processes. And then you go and everything is failing. And you go to your mentor and you say, this is my business process. And I just noticed this cog is completely failing. And everything is draining away from my business. What do I do? And this mentor literally tells you what to do. But if you don't have a system, he can't help you. So those are the three things. Um, I hope it helped you. We have a Q&A, so don't worry, you can ask some questions. Um, for everybody involved, thank you very much for coming. I have uh, free goodies for you. You can go to whynot3.com, why not, and then three the number .com, slash venture cafe. Simple, why not 3com slash venture cafe. You'll get a free ebook, you'll get um, my daily creed that I used to read for two, three years straight that changed my mindsets um, and helped. And you also get me on the email list every Friday. I tell you what's happening every Friday. Today, uh, tomorrow I'll probably be talking about this. And I also came from uh, three countries where I was filming a project. So, um, yeah, if you have any more questions. Oh, also, we wanted to offer, so those are my two lovely partners in crime. You can approach them. Um, for, so what's happening on the 16th of September, we're bringing the official workshop. Um, I've delivered this workshop now in six countries. I go deeper into every system. I go deeper into how I mapped out everything. Health, wealth, and relationship is the meta stuff. I go really deep into um, how I wrote my book, how I did everything. Um, my book is based on that workshop. And in that workshop, there's an extensive Q&A and everybody sets expectations and I haven't had a workshop yet where the expectations weren't answered at the end. So usually it runs two hours or something like that. It's very small because if it's a big group, I, I can't give you the time. That's why I like these small groups. And yeah, so if you want to join, just approach my partners in crime. If you approach today and you sign up today, I'll give you a 20 minute one-on-one. -on -one. You can choose whether it's Why Not 3, where I look at your work-life balance systems, or whether it's my other company, Lightning Video Editors, where I look at your video marketing automation or your business automation systems, 
which is what I do with the big companies. Um, I would suggest the work-life balance systems though, because if you learn the stuff in the work-life balance, you can apply it also to your business. So yeah, that was it. If you have any more questions, you can ask me right now and I'll try to answer them as good as possible. Um, yeah, I have a question. It's not clear yet, so take yeah. you through my uh, thought process. I, I read a thing the other day, it was not necessarily business oriented, it was more personal. Yeah. Uh, and it was an article about a guy who um, trained himself to learn more habits. That yeah. Learning new stuff, he was approaching it through learning new habits yeah. and really setting really low goals but also not doing one then more habit at a time. For example, doing five push-ups in the morning or yeah. doing five minutes of Duolingo when you want to learn a new langu yeah. language. It helps. I don't know, it could be uh, learn bookkeeping in a year yeah, yeah. or pick up on your networking, whatever. Um, and what stuck by me is that he said that you have to set really low goals so you can do them for months and then it will become a habit. Yeah and you cannot do more than one at a time, where I would think I can do five minutes of Duolingo and yeah. jogging for a kilometer every yeah. day. Uh, so I tried a bunch of stuff, and then they've all disappeared now, because I did cheat and I did do reading five, uh, reading two pages a day of a book, yeah. and doing 10 push-ups in the morning. I still after a few months, like it faded, yeah. and I, well, I'm gonna try it again, but I, you know, my motivation is a bit Okay. Less. What tracker did um, you use? Yeah, I think I didn't have a tracker. I had someone that knew I was trying this, who I would kind of like report to, but he wasn't doing it yeah. himself either. Yeah, maybe there was no tracker. Yeah, so there, there's a um, good book. The question I think is how do you keep yourself motivated and yeah. do you also have this idea of maybe you should isolate and set low goals, do one thing at a time? Yeah. Because from your story it kind of feels like you would take on a bunch of stuff still at the same time. You have to, you have to always combine stuff in situations. So in the workshop I go deeper into how much you can actually um, cover. So there's a thing called the Warren Buffett method. A lot of people have stuck their names on it, but I used to know it as a Warren Buffett method. In essence, what it says is uh, Warren Buffett always focuses on three stuff. Um, and three is usually the maximum. And in the beginning, I used to experiment with this. And I would say, oh, Warren Buffett doesn't know anything, I'll just do it myself. So I experimented with like four or five stuff. And like something like um, a relationship, like a partner, business uh, studies at the time that's all a focus so when you start doing also sports and hanging out with friends that's all a focus because you're diverting your focus and your time to it um, so the moment you start going over the three digested a lot of toxins and there's this fad now about gluten, right? So the way I know that gluten is bad for me is because I take naps afterwards. When I eat good food, I'm high energy and there's, I don't take naps when I'm like, I sleep like a baby and I don't take naps. When you take a nap, that means your body's processing something you shouldn't be eating. So that was like the biggest takeaway, like the food wise and how to recognize that something is bad for me. So for instance, uh, the, one of the biohackers mindset is look experiment with it yourself I can tell you the, the world here but you have to go and apply it and see if it works for yourself so uh, Dave Asprey talked about how milk is bad for you uh, bad for you right he has a graph and milk is not really good there unless it's like from a really organic cow but some people in Europe process milk way better so you have to go out check the milk and see if it works for you. It's not because Dave Asprey or some other big guy says this is good for you, that it's good, uh, or bad for you, that it's bad. So go out and test it and see. If you take a nap or you get tired, that means the food is bad. And that's how I started mapping out. And after two years, I know what to eat and what not to eat. I know that if I eat um, gluten, I get tired. So whenever I have like big conferences like this and my mental energy has to be like on level, I don't eat gluten, I don't eat cookies. But the moment the conference is over, I get a cookie or two and then go for, take a nap. <laughs> it's worth the whatever, right? Um, but for instance, I, I do martial arts, right? When I'm training and I go eat a cookie or something like that, you feel it. 
Like you feel it when you're training. But the main things is like that guided meditation, heart math, just mental energy, and then the foods, um, which, yeah, and then for a while I didn't exercise, but because I maintained the not toxins um, and high fat diet, I maintained my physique. And then I started eating cookies and everything. Do you, um, do you eat food in a period of time? Because yeah, I'm so doing I, I, eight hours. Intermittent fasting. Um, so intermittent fasting, so you only get into ketogenic once you hit like a 14 hours. 14 or 15, yeah. yeah between Something like that. So what I do is from 8 or 9 and then 2 I start eating again. And then oh, I get okay. do it like that. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, that usually works. Sometimes when I don't travel it doesn't work. But, so there's a difference when you're first starting out and you have a lot of toxins in your body, get activated charcoal. Yeah. Because else all the fat storages will burn up, all the toxins will go to your brain, you're gonna feel really bad. That's why people that first time detox, they just, like, if it's really bad, they can go to the hospital. Like if you're really fat and you start um, losing all that weight, um, then all those toxins can go to your brain and you can go to the hospital. If it's like okay fat, you're not gonna go to the hospital, but you might end up feeling really bad for a week or two. So get activated charcoal, you can get it at the pharmacy. Um, I, for instance, the only thing that I travel with, no matter what, is activated charcoal. Like, I don't go anywhere without activated charcoal. Just because if I eat gluten and I have to give a speech, I can eat activated charcoal before that, I'm fine after 20 minutes. So you don't take, like, other supplements? Yeah, so um, I have, like, sleeping hacks uh, on conferences. Like, some conferences invite me, and then I barely sleep on those conferences because it's just, like, from eight hour in the morning till 10 at night, sometimes later. And so sometimes on one of the conferences where this, where the work-life balance workshop started, that was a five day conference where I slept two hours. And then I have a assess machine, it's called the cerebral electrostimulation machine. I have GABA and magnesium. Um, and there's like an entire hour of story on how I got there. I, I wrote a blog post about this, um, how I combined magnesium. And then if magnesium doesn't work, I go to GABA. And then if I see the spray or the powder or no, or the body in the, in the oh, so magnesium also helps if you wash yourself with magnesium because your body absorbs magnesium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have pills. Okay. Um, and so most of the sleep deficiencies, and I, I know for myself, so for myself, my sleep deficiencies, most of it comes from magnesium deficiency. The way I knew it is because I was doing my blood analysis and I figured out that my magnesium levels were low on those months where I felt really bad. So magnesium helps me with sleep and it usually helps a lot of people with sleep. So if you're struggling with sleep, try magnesium. From your assistance, <laughs> question. Do you have a, a, a special brand that is your favorite? Did you check that out? For magnesium. Magnesium. Or oh, when you get supplements, get pure. Never, like, doesn't matter which one, as long as it's pure. There's a Dutch one called Invendam. I'm not quite sure what it's called. Yeah, good. no, I have several of them. But use trackers. I mean, it sounds horrible when you're doing blood analysis and stuff, but look at your magnesium levels before pills and after pills, and you'll pretty much know if it works for you. Yeah. Like the blood analysis, like, do you just do it on your own? Like, no, <laughs> I hate needles. I stopped doing it because I hate needles. Um, so I went to the doctor, mm -hmm. And there's an entire system on how to find a doctor that will do those blood analysis every month because they don't want to like waste money and stuff like that. So you have to find a doctor that is actually interested and reads about new innovation because what they learn in, in medical school is based on the beliefs back then. So if they learned something 10 years ago, they still think that works. So you need to find a doctor that is actually keeping up with the new trends so he knows what's happening. Once you found a doctor and you will know, um, you can just ask him whenever you want a blood analysis. I know Tim Ferriss started in the beginning like that. Uh, the Bulletproof Diet guy also wrote an entire blog post on how to find a doctor. I'm not going to write a blog post about it, but uh, yeah, just ask a doctor and be safe in doing that. Like, don't get your own needle and stuff. I was just interested in like, yeah, tracking this. Uh, like no, I had a doctor. Up, so I was just wondering how we could do that. Go to a doctor and, and then just, instead of mail, so he used to mail me my results. And then I asked him to email them because then I could actually like put them next to each other. Um, yeah, in case he does that. All right, thanks. Sorry, what was the link again where you could 
why not 3.com slash venture cafe? Okay. Something else? No. No, thanks. Juicy? Sorry? Juicy? Sorry? Juicy. Juicy? Wait, steroids? No. Like it's 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 vegetables. Oh, okay. So we're juicing. It's a funny trend because, but this is my opinion, and I'm not an expert on this. So this is just my opinion. So when you're going for fruits, you need a maximum of 24 grams per day before fructose converts into fats. So if you take a chart of all the fruits, like bananas, super high fructose. That means you can eat like two bananas and that's it. So if you put three, three bananas into your juicer, what's going to happen is it's all going to go into your fat. So that's why I don't juice because I'd rather eat my food and know how much I'm consuming. Um, and so apples is pretty low. So I eat three apples a day max. I usually eat two, but I know that if I eat two and I'm hungry, I can get a third one because then I'm below my 24 grams. And so it doesn't convert into fat. And like, I don't get too fat. So that's my opinion on fruits. Yeah, juicing can be vegetables. If it's vegetables, you can eat as much as you want, as long again toxin levels. So if it's unspray, if you're on a budget, there are some that um, adapt less toxins, like avocado. It adopts less toxins, like white rice as well. Um, but some of them, like it's better to go biological. But biological as in at the farm or not as a bio sticker because I've experimented with bio meat and that is just, this is not bio meat, I felt horrible afterwards. Um, but the way, the way you know is literally go clean for a while, like really, really clean based on what the diet says and then start picking up one by one. Um, and if your store says they're biological strawberries but they're not, you're gonna feel it. So with strawberries, I can feel it. The vegetables less. Usually your vegetables are fine-ish. Um, carrots like do biological stuff. Like that. But yeah, that's my opinion on it. Um, like spinach and stuff is really hard to contaminate, so that's good. But I would refer you again to the experts like Mark Sisson, Mark's Daily Apple, and, and Dave Asper with Bulletproof Diet. And so you drink your coffee with butter? Yeah, I used to I used to do it and I'm going to pick it up in September. I did it for like two years. And this is the reason why I started doing the blood analysis because I was consuming a lot of fat, like a lot. I was consuming four sticks of butter per week. And I was worried because one of my doctors, the one that didn't like biohacking and stuff like that, said, you're going to have a heart attack. And then the next week she did my blood analysis and I was like twice as healthy as another person. And she's like, oh, well, well, whatever. Literally, that's how she reacted. Um, so, yeah, I was doing partially because I wasn't sure if fat consumption was good. But with fat consumption, you have to be, again, careful what kind of fat. I only eat Kerrygold butter. Um, I try to stay away from all the other butters. You can also see the butter. This is a biohacking convention now. It's talking about work life balance. I can talk for hours about this stuff. You can talk to me later. A any more questions? Or does that answer your question? Yeah, no, we could talk about the food stuff. Yeah, is everybody interested about the food stuff? No, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can talk later. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Do you have any tips on procrastination? Yeah, I wrote a blog post, 101 tips on procrastination. <laughs> and then the whole clue was like, I can give you 100 tips and it won't work, so I'll give you 101. <laughs> no, the idea about procrastination is the main thing why we actually can get clients that pay is because procrastination is um, a thing that pops up when you don't know your why, the way Simon Sinek describes it. And your why needs to be described in a sentence or two. And once you know that why in its complete form, because there was a while where, so my why is to inspire freedom in others so that they can follow their passions and become the best they can be. For a long while, it was, I want to inspire freedom in others so that they can follow their passions. And then what happened is I set up a national trainer's team for a company. I founded it, I, I worked really hard to get it. And then we recruited some people that didn't fit in there. And, and what happened was I walked away really mad and I founded it but I had to walk away for my health uh, because I couldn't manage the stress and, and seeing that people could ruin something that I created. 
Um, and so the last sentence, the last part of that sentence popped up, which is, um, I want to inspire freedom in others so that they can follow their passions and become the best they can be. The reason I got so mad at those people and walked away is because I wanted um, the people under the na national trainers team to become the best they can be. And I knew that those people in charge, where unfortunately I recruited them, so it was my fault and I had to accept my own mistake, um, but they weren't the best, they wouldn't take out the best out of the people. And so I walked away mad. And, but at least it gave me my why. And now whenever I start a venture or I work with people, I test them. And I see, can they be the best they can be? Can they deliver what they want to deliver? Because I know else five years, 10 years into the future, something's gonna happen that's gonna clash and it's gonna, and that's how you start predicting into recruitment. After a while, when you've done enough recruitment, you start seeing that. So once you have that why, you know which areas of industries you need to go into. So if I go, for instance, into, if I go into art and painting, I'm a really bad painter. So I'm gonna procrastinate on painting. Or if I study painting, I'm gonna procrastinate on painting. I'm gonna hate it. But if I go into building, so building businesses, building systems, building biohacking stuff, like I like building, I love it. Because I know I can improve constantly and become the best I can be. So it's my passion. I don't procrastinate there. Do you get it? So you need to find those industries. And when you enter those industries, you don't procrastinate. And that's my, that's my answer on procrastination. As long as you are in the industry where your soul is getting eaten away, your body is going to procrastinate. Um, and there are like simple practical tips that you can endure through your procrastination, but what's going to happen in the end is a clash. After five years, you're going to walk away mad at the world and not understand why. And so in order to prevent that, look in the beginning, what is your passion? What are you really interested in that you can maintain for 10 years, for 20 years? Does that answer that? You can do practical stuff like Pomodoro, which is like 25 minutes focus, five minutes pause, 25 minutes. Um, so you can do those things, but you're gonna just be pushing. And you can push, I just don't recommend it. It leads to burnouts. Doesn't it just need an accountability buddy, someone else? That's in accountability the helps. The issue with procrastination is that if you push it, even with accountability buddies, like at one point there is going to come a burnout. You're pushing your body. There's a strain on your willpower and mental energy. You can maintain it for a year or two. But after five years and six years, one of my best friends, the reason I'm standing here, the reason I built this entire business around this, one of my best friends ended up in the hospital because she was pushing constantly. Because she was procrastinating, she was pushing, and she's a high achiever and pushing. And the 21st century promotes pushing. And I'm telling you, don't push. Go into those industries where you don't have to push. Sometimes, like accountancy in business, you have to do it. So you push for a day or two. And then you go 28 days into the business that you love. If you offer me a million dollars in any other industry right now, I know I'm not gonna take it because I know that if I maintain my pace in the two industries that I'm here right now, I will get there. I'll get there one day. I don't need it, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Um, and so if you're interested in something to build a career out of it, like just to get the money, that's usually not the motivation that you want because then you can go into ICT or something, get more money. Um, if you if you really find out why you're interested in music, and and you understand, I like music because I I know I can make someone feel like me one day when my life changed or something. You know, when you figure that that one thing out, then you're gonna look at it and think, wow, if I do this for ten years, who knows where I'm gonna end up. If you want to stop procrastination, you need your why, but you also need a vision. And you go for that vision. Um, but it needs to be in an industry where you don't push yourself. Because if you push yourself, you're, like really, you can maintain it for two or three years. And I see people maintaining it. But I also see people burning out after five or six years. And that's the part they don't tell me. Um, last thing, it's not necessarily that I don't enjoy it, but I mean, um, it's something in general. Like, I want to eat healthy, but... Um, I don't do it, I just eat it quick. Uh, let's say I put Nutella on my bread or something yeah. just because it tastes good. Yeah. I want to uh, do better, but 
it's just laziness yeah. in general. Okay. So with food, there are two ways. There's a way you were raised, and so you associate it. So do you know NLP? Does everybody know NLP? Mm -hmm. So neuro linguistic programming. I don't completely agree with everything they say, but they have one thing, which is anchoring. So if you were raised with Nutella and good feelings and you did that for 20 years, that's a habit that's anchored to Nutella that you need to break. And breaking habits with like negative associate, this is, this is research. Based on research, positive, Afro, positive um, association is all, beats always negative. So instead of focusing on how Nutella can improve everything, get another food. Like maybe I used to butter was that for me and link really good memories to that so that when you feel not very good or like not very blah blah then you get that uh, like butter that, that's healthy and not the Nutella so you ha actually have a choice between good feelings because you're not choosing between foods you're choosing between good feelings that's the first thing so you can anchor another food to give even more better feelings than the other one and then the second thing is go very clean for a while and then start picking up Nutella again. And you're going to feel it. And then you're going to get your negative association together with your positive one. Because um, after a while when you don't take naps and you're high energy constantly and then you eat like bread or Nutella and it just slams you down for three hours, like after a week or two you're like, enough, I don't want to touch this. So like for instance, I can pick up a cookie or two, like that's small, but if I eat a loaf of bread, like that's it. So in restaurants, you're never going to see me eat pasta or a loaf of bread, because I know I'll be completely smacked down. A cookie I can still push through. This is sm small minor thing. This is a small bottle. Personal curiosity, do you drink alcohol? Well, uh, so whiskey. But, so the idea behind alcohol is, it's not good if you look at the overall scheme. If you're in high stress like situations, so why is why not three existing? Because of the work life balance, so that I can maintain that effective point and not burn out. But sometimes it happens that I go over my point, and the way it outs in my body is hyperventilation. I get chronic hyperventilation and start breathing really bad. From just just in general from stress. Um, so I start just gasping for air all the time, uh, and I don't even notice it. So whiskey then, which, is, which used to be in the Middle Ages, um, a, like health thing. But anyways, I take whiskey because it de-stresses me. So a little bit of alcohol stimulates GABA, which is a hormone in your uh, brain, which makes you sleep better. If you take a little bit of whiskey, it'll work for four hours, and then you'll wake up in the middle of the night. So if you take a little bit more, you'll sleep the eight hours. Um, I experimented with that as well. But so I take um, alcohol, specifically whiskey, because I know it's less toxins uh, than wine, for instance, um, and I like the taste. In those moments where I know that the stress is too much and it's not worth the trade. So stress is a bigger killer than alcohol. So once like stress hits higher, then like the negative points that I get from alcohol, I drink a little bit of alcohol to lower the stress. Isn't that suppression? <laughs> no, so this is only, so I take, uh, what do you mean with suppression? I mean, you're covering It's a temporary thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a temporary yeah. thing. Secondary gain. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a temporary thing. So obviously there are like, like heart math and all these other things in my food, but these are warning signs. The issue with stress is, stress doesn't go like this. Stress goes like this, and this is a point where you see symptoms. You hit this point, you start seeing symptoms. You start doing something about it, but it still goes up. It just starts going like that. And in this period, when I have all this hyperventilation and I can't sleep and all that stuff, it doesn't happen now because I have all my systems and my trackers, but what I used to do is I would drink uh, whiskey for, uh, for like it would be like the maximum I did was maybe 15 days. And then every night I just take a sip of, like it's like a little bit, it's not a lot. Just to stimulate the GABA and that's it. But yeah, it's, a, it's not a solution. It's definitely not a solution. It's not gonna solve your problems. So you still need to work about the systems and creating the systems around it and the trackers to maintain, a, like to put your stress down. It's, it's 
Yes, yeah, like way, way over time. time. I think uh, so. Thank you very much, guys.